the exile. What is Galut? What is exile exactly? And should we go back to Eretz Israel, even though we are in the Galut right now? Is there any significance to going back? Under what circumstances? A quick introduction. It is a well-known fact in Judaism that Hakadosh Baruch Hu, God, Mashgiach Alenu Vashgacha Pratit. He oversees the entire world, but especially Am Yisrael, in a very specific way, in a very unique way. We call it Ashgacha Pratit, Divine Providence, which means that he's continuously aware of every one of our actions, and everything that happens to us happens by his will. In other words, we're not Tachat Mazalot, we're not under the stars, even though we have, each one of us has his own mazal, but in the end, our relationship with Hashem is such that He oversees, He's involved, and He intercedes if necessary in every one of our life. So whether it's the entire nation of Israel, or whether it's any individual Jew, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is at all times connected with us. Kadosh Baruch Hu has also demonstrated and has said it many times that He loves us and all that He wishes for us is for us to be successful, for us to have a good life, just like a father wants the best for his child. And this is what we say in the prayer of the Hagim. You have chosen us from amongst the nations. You've chosen us. You loved us, you wanted us, and you've elevated us above all other languages. You have sanctified us with your mitzvot, with your commandments. And you've brought us close to worshiping you, to your service. And you've placed your name, your holy name, upon us. These prayers and all the mitzvot, what they have in common is to instill in us, to imbue in us that feeling, that knowledge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to be with us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants the best for us. He loves us. It is very clear that that is his attitude towards us. Sometimes it doesn't appear to be like that. And that's what tonight's topic is all about, is an example of where that does not appear to be. But generally speaking, Hashem does love us and wants the best for us. Now imagine somebody who wants the best for you, loves you, gives to you, takes care of you, is preoccupied about you, and he doesn't have that same feeling that it's being reciprocated, that he or she loves them, that he or she cares as much about them. Imagine somebody who's been giving so much, who's shown time after time, he has proven his love, his friendship, his care and concern. And here he's seeing that the other person, the other individual to whom he has been so nice to, is not as nice to him does not show the same love and same affection and same concern. How would it feel? I think terrible. And when it comes to human relationships, if those, if those are the feelings, if that is the disappointment, then how does it usually end? Either in a divorce, if it's a husband and wife, or in a complete separation in friendships, or in an tremendous amount of distance at least between the two individuals who used to be close to each other. That is not the way it is with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. <coughs> with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even though He has given us so much, He always looks after us and even if we have become distant from Him and have not reciprocated in kind, He continuously looks after us and waits for the moment that we're going to come back to Him. He allows us a chance to return. He allows us the chance to repair the relationship. 
And he never gives up hope. That's a big difference. And when he does get upset at us, and whoever reads the Torah can see examples of when Hashem is upset, angry, not happy. These are, remember, human terms that we recognize, and that is why the Torah is employing them. The Torah is employing, using terms that we recognize, that we use in our language. It does not mean that Hashem actually is angry and upset in the way we understand anger and being upset. The reality is that when Hashem is upset, or as we call it upset, it is only on the surface. Hashem is not human in any form that He can actually become angry and upset the way we do. So these are just descriptions of a certain mode of operation, if you want to call it that, on how He sees us, what He intends to do about it, how He's going to act upon that. It's on the surface. Imagine a father who loves his child and he wants to show him that he's very upset at him. Deep down he's controlled. He, of course he's not angry, angry. This is his son who he loves. This is his child. But he definitely wants to communicate the message to that child that I don't want you to do it again. I don't want you to behave this way. That your behavior is unacceptable to me. So what he may do is he may show on his face, he may show on the surface that he's very upset at the child, but deep down he still loves him. Similarly, that is the way it happens with Akadosh Baruch Hu and Amisa in the Jewish nation. On the surface it may appear to be, and it is very, very much that Hashem is unhappy with us, angry perhaps. There are various levels of anger. Nevertheless, deep down, he always cared about us. There are many hints that a child can get that his father is upset at him. All kinds of hints. He doesn't buy him gifts. He doesn't speak to him. He ignores him, right? What is the greatest hint of all? The most serious hint of all, and it's no, really no longer a hint. It is very, very clear, no longer a hint. And that is when Hashem, or when the father, throws the child out of his home. For a father to kick his child out of the home, it must be that that child really misbehaved. He must have been that he did something terribly wrong, right? <laughs> Otherwise, what normal father would do something like that? It is only normal, natural, for every father and mother to love their children. How many parents have done so much for their children they were willing to give their life for their kids. I mean, So for a father to throw, for a devoted father to throw his child out of, out of the home, it must have taken something terrible. What is he saying by that? By throwing the child out of his home, what is he saying? Listen, you're not interested in me. You don't care about what I have to say. And you're not concerned about the fact that you will not have the support from me. Then go on your own. Lech lecha. Lech mi po. Go. I don't need you. That's basically what the father is saying when he's throwing out his child. You're basically not interested. You couldn't care less. You're not even concerned that I will not support you. That's how you have that chutzpah, the gall, the gall to rebel or to go against my word and wishes. Okay, so then go on your own. Let's see. You fend for yourself, as they say in English then I don't want to have anything to do with you. Now, I'm not in any way recommending that any parent should do that. It's definitely not a good thing to do. You always want to leave the door open. Yes? Wouldn't sometimes it be nice to, you should go out and you know, just in case? No, no, Judaism, Judaism does not believe in a child leaving his parents' home before he gets married. Okay? A lot, a lot, that, that, that's only a tradition in this country where the parents want to have their privacy or for some other interest and they throw their, ki their kid out when he's a 16, 17 year old. Go rent yourself a place. The family unit in America, in this country, especially in this generation, is not so bonded, it's not, not so together. This doesn't happen in Latin America. Unless the, the child is boarding in a university, away from home, that's different. But no child leaves his parents home before he's married. Everybody wants to be with their parents as much as possible. 
in many communities in the world, kids come back and spend many Shabbatot, Saturdays, with their parents and their family. But in a, the, Amer the, Amer the typical American is a lot cooler to that idea. You know, go be on your own, learn to be a man. These are all excuses. And this is not Jew uh, Jewish in nature, in origin, this idea of going on your own. You are with your parents, you care for them, they, care, they take care of you until, you, until you get married, of course. So, the concept of Galut, of the diaspora, the exile, is a similar concept of a child being thrown out of his home. But what it represents when it does happen is an itnatkut, as we would call it in Hebrew, a complete detachment from that which is precious to you, your home, and your family. That's what Galut is. If we were to define the word exile, this is basically what it means. Disconnecting, detaching yourself from that which is most precious to you, from your land, from your family, from your home. We, we find that many empires in the past actually used this kind of punishment to exile or to expel various peoples, civilizations from their country, from their country of origin, scatter them all over the world. It's called population change, where they would exchange people from one country, from one place, one region, with another, just to get them out. This was a way used to punish rebellious people. This was done in the past. In Judaism, however, there's no real concept called punishment, per se. The word onish, if you look at the word in Hebrew, onish, ein vav nun shin, onish, punishment, it contains with it, within it, the word avon. Ein vav nun shin, onish, contains within that word of punishment, contains the word avon, sin. Ultimately, if one is being punished by Hashem, by God, it is because of a sin. Ultimately, the purpose of that punishment that we call punishment, of that predicament, of that situation where one is in because of his sins, is for a purpose. What's that purpose? A kapara. It's an atonement. Hashem wants us to cleanse ourselves, to remove all the blemishes and the stains that we've brought upon ourselves, that create distance between Him and us. He wants us to come back to Him. He wants us to get closer to Him. But there is a system that he put in place of judgment, din. And judgment has to handle certain situations in a particular way. You can't get away with from it. You can come back, you can ask for mercy, you can do teshuvah, you can repent. That's fine. That's another another part of the of the system that is also set in place for to enable people to come back and to rectify their errors. So Real onish does not exist in Judaism. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu punishes, it serves a purpose, a higher purpose. It's a kapara, it's an atonement. Where do we find this atonement in the Torah that is very clearly spelled out as an atonement? An Eir Miklat, a city of refuge. Do you know who would go to a city of refuge? One who killed somebody unintentionally. He did not intend to kill him. It was not premeditated. It just happened. It was a semi-accident. Not a real accident, but it was a semi-accident. It was unintentional. And instead of giving him the death penalty, because he did not do it intentionally, the Torah prescribes as an atonement that he spent many years in a city of refuge. Certain cities in Eretz Israel that were designated as prisons, like a prison, but it's not a real prison. It is more like house arrest. You had to live your place of living your livelihood, your parnasah, your family, and go and spend years, perhaps, in this other city, in Eretz Yisrael, until the death of the high priest in the Kohen Gadol. Yes? No, if he would not go there, he's, if he would not go there, then he may be chased by the family members of the victim who may kill him as a, uh, because of revenge. They're upset. Some people you know, would seek revenge. So in order to protect him from the revenge of those family members, he w it would be in the be his best interest to go as quickly as possible to that city of refuge. 
And depending, of course, when the high priest will die, that's when he goes back home. Some people would spend less, some people would spend more time, and all of that is managed from above. How many years one would have to spend in a irmiklat, in a city of refuge? But the idea, again, be, behind staying there, away from your family, is a kapara. It is an atonement for that individual. When it comes to galut, to real galut, the Torah warns us that this may happen. Various occasions you will find that the Torah, where the, word, where the Torah uses the words "vayzaret chem bagoim," I will scatter you amongst the nations, or the other example of Yolechat Hashem Otcha Umalkecha, Hashem will lead you and your king to some faraway country where you will be many years amongst the goyim, away from your home. So we find that the Torah warns us in advance that this, there's always the possibility that this may happen. But as a last resort, it appears from the Torah that galut is almost like a last resort. Like the example we gave before, that the father kicking out his son. Like a last resort, Hashem does not want to do that. He, he would rather not do that. But that's a very, very serious punishment, if we can call it punishment. There's one that is a little bit more severe than this, more severe than Galut, and that's called Manuchi Asterastir, I will hide my face from you. When you will be amongst the Gentiles, you'll be amongst the Goyim, it will appear to be, only it will appear, that I'm not around, I don't get involved, I let them do what they want, and the wicked are somehow in control, and the Jews are suffering greatly. Where is God, they ask. And the Torah says, and you will ask that question too. So the Torah already predicted in advance that all of this will happen. You will even ask that question. You will be puzzled. How could it be? Where is he? How come he has abandoned me? If he exists, where is he? Why doesn't he do something? about? Why doesn't he stop this? Go back to the Torah and read a little bit about why these things happen. And some of, some of this I covered already in the lecture about the Holocaust, an overview of the Holocaust of what was the Holocaust all about? How could we understand it? How could we make any sense of such terrible tragedies? Well, the first step to do is to learn the Torah because the Torah predicted this. The Torah warned us that this will happen. And the Torah even tells us why it happens. But not everybody wants to read. Not everybody wants to learn. Their own tradition, their own Torah, it spells it out very, very clearly why things happen. They don't happen for nothing. There's always a reason for something. And Galut exile is like the last resort. It's a terrible tragedy when somebody's being removed from his home, his home being destroyed. You know, obviously something must have happened very seriously for Hashem to have taken that move. What are the reasons for Galut? Why does Galut occur? So the rabbis tell us, Galut ba la'olam, exile comes to the world. And when we say exile, we include in that people, families being expelled from their homes, being evicted. There's all kinds of evictions. And I'm not talking about eviction because you didn't pay your rent. I'm talking about your house being taken away from you, having to move because things are terrible, things went wrong, somehow you... People having to move from home to home, from city to city, from country to country, it's also a galut, it's a tiltul. It's a lot of difficulty. Starting all over again, looking for a job, that's also a form of galut. It's a personalized galut, perhaps. It applies only to one family. We're talking about the galut of the entire Jewish nation, but still it's the same idea. Galut, ba'la olam, where does galut come? Why are people expelled? Why are people detached? The detachment from Aza. Why were they kicked out? Now, even though we know that that was not a good idea, now I think everybody's convinced it was a terrible idea to throw Jews out of their home. This is Eretz Yisrael according to everyone. Nevertheless, if it was allowed to happen, it was a decree from Shamaim. In Shamaim, they allowed for such a terrible decree for, for entire families, entire homes to be thrown out. Now go find yourself another place, start all over again. That which you have built over so many years. It's a galut. So why does galut occur? either because of Gilu Yarayot, Abu Dazara, and Shvichut Damim, the three cardinal sins of idol worship, adultery, and murder. It can also occur because of the lack of observance of Shemitah Ta'aretz, the sabbatical in Eretz Israel when we were all there, 
we had the beautiful mitzvah of leaving the land fallow for one year, the seventh year, Shemitah, not working, immersing oneself more in the Torah, mitzvot, and not working the land for one year. The land would be blessed on the sixth year. You, your crop, you will have a bumper crop, the sixth, the, and you will have enough on the sixth year to last you into the seventh and the eighth. It was a great miracle. It was beautiful. But not everybody was observant of that. So Hashem says, listen, you didn't leave the land fallow. Now it's going to remain fallow for many, many years to come while you're not there, while you're kicked out. These are the basic reasons of why Galut occurs. But it could also occur, as Yirmiyahu, the prophet himself, complains, cries out in his book, Yirmiyahu, al Aretz. What's the reason why the land was lost? Because they have abandoned my Torah. They were disrespectful of the Torah, of the observance of Mitzvot, which is a more general description of why Galut can occur. In other words, they have given up or distanced themselves from me, Hashem says, from that which is most supposed to be the most precious thing to them, me, the Torah, then I have to do the same. Otherwise, they won't get the hint. Otherwise, they won't understand what they're doing. How am I going to tell it to them? They're not listening to the prophets. They're not listening to the Torah. They're not listening. I'm going to have to give them very, very powerful medication. With what intent? Kapara, of course, and atonement. But the ultimate intent is they got to come to their senses. They got to realize that what they've done is, is not right. I've given them so much. I've been so nice to them. And here, they are distancing themselves. In their behavior, they are distancing themselves from me, from the Torah, then I got to do the same. Every galut that we've had has really been for a slightly different reason. So let me briefly go over the various galut, beginning with galut mitzrayim, which is what we're reading now in the Torah and the parasha, Shemot, Vaira, Bo, Beshalach. We read a little bit about galut mitzrayim, and that is a very difficult galut to understand because the Jewish nation is just being formed. They haven't done anything wrong yet. They're already being thrown into Egypt, spending 210 years there. Slaves, hard labor. Why? Part of the reason why the Jews are in Egypt under difficult circumstances is to prepare them to be servants of Hashem. Hashem makes them servants of Paro in order for them to be able to accept the yoke of heaven, the yoke of mitzvot, the burden, commitment, responsibilities. So that Egyptian bondage is actually preparing them for a good thing. But wait a minute. Okay, that's very nice, but why should they suffer? <laughs> you don't make them suffer just because you want to prepare them. Well, part of the suffering is for a, 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 uh, a purpose that we can, I guess, call birur. Birur absolut. Birur absolut means to refine them, refine them of any impurities that they may have. What impurities could they have? Remember, how did they get there in the first place? Because they sold Yosef. They sold their own brother. That's a terrible impurity, a terrible characteristic that they have in them that they have to refine. Baseless hatred. Sinat Hinam. Ami said before they become a nation, they have to be unified. They have to be one. By becoming second-class citizens, by being looked down at, by being a minority, anytime you have a minority, they usually stick together. So they're going to become a minority. They're going to hopefully remove that sinat chinam, that baseless hatred. They're going to hopefully become one nation. They're going to unify. And in, in this way, they will be able to hold on to the Torah. A nation that is not together, that does not believe in the same cause, the same goal, they're going to split. They're going to, not going to succeed in, their, in this mission. They have a mission here. Hashem wants to give them a mission. How are they going to hold on to this mission? How are they going to continue for ages doing Hashem's will? We've got to make them strong. The good thing that these people are stubborn, right? The stubbornness is going to help them too. They're going to persist. But they have to be united because if they're going to ever not be united, that's a recipe for disaster. And that's what happened in the Second Temple era, and which we're going to be speaking about next week. Next week's topic will be, why is this the diaspora that we're in, Galut Edom, the longest one of all? Egypt was 210 years. The next Galut is Babel. Babel, the Babylonian exile, 70 years. That's it. 
after 70 years, they come home to rebuild the second temple. Why did they go to Babel for 70 years? Obviously, during the first temple era, they did have some of those problems. The adultery, tremendous amount of idol worshipping, murder too. There was a problem with the Shemitah, and a lack of observance of the Shemitah, of the sabbatical year. But you know what happened prior to Galut Babel? An incredible thing happened. About a hundred years before the Jewish people dispersed to Babel, the Assyrian king, Ashur, not Babylonian, from the north, Ashur, came and exiled the northern tribes, and they have never come back yet. And that's going to be another topic that we'll be talking about a couple weeks from now. Where are they? What happened to them? The ten lost tribes. Fascinating topic, because they're going to come back soon. So we want to know who they are. Where are they? But they were exiled before, and they have not come back. And the reason for their exile also was idol worshipping. The north was much more involved in idol worshipping than the south. The south, which comprised of the tribes of Yehuda and Yamin. So therefore, they have not come back yet. So for, as far as Bavel, we have a very short period of time. We have 70 years. What follows Bavel? Anybody know? Which diaspora follows, or which exile follows the, the, the exile of Babylonia? We come back, remember, to Eretz Israel, right? We rebuild the second temple. What's the next exile? No, what, where, did anybody go anywhere? What, where was the next stop? Where was the next exile? No. They were in Persia during the time that they were in Babel, too. Galut Yavan. Even though Galut Yavan, the Greek exile, is not one of the main exiles, because we are still living in Eretz Israel, we did not move to Greece. We were not exiled by the Greeks. The next one is really the Roman exile. Well, there is nevertheless a semi-exile called Galut Yavan that happens halfway through the Second Temple era. That's where the story of Hanukkah emerges. What's Hanukkah? Em Getting out of that, somewhat, getting out of that Greek spiritual exile. I call it spiritual exile because we did not leave Israel. We're still there. We're still in our land. We did not even gain independence after Hanukkah. The only independence we gained was the independence or the freedom, I should say, to be able to do our work in the Bet HaMikdash, unhindered. In other words, to perform the misvot that they were trying to stop us. This is a spiritual exile. This is a very dangerous one too, because this is what leads to assimilation, to assimilating the ways of the Goy. That did not last for too long because the Greeks eventually were thrown out, taken over by the Romans. Comes along the Roman Empire, destroys the second Bet HaMikdash, and in a number of years, the entire Jewish nation almost is exiled outside of Israel. I say almost because there was a remnant of Jews left there, but a lot of them are scattered, and this exile is very, very different than the rest. Reason number one, as I said, this is the longest one for some reason. Reason number two, this exile is a dispersion over the entire globe, from Alaska to New Zealand. There's Jews everywhere. And that came about as a result of Galut Edom. And who's Edom? Esav. And Esav, of course, at one point, later on after the Hurban of the Bait, becomes Christianity. So it's Christianity exiling the Jews. And many, many Jews ending up living in Christian nations. Even though we have Muslim nations too, nevertheless that is the most, the more, the most dominant power for a number of years wherever the Jews, where most of the Jews are. One more Galut that we're experiencing today that did not exist a hundred years ago, that the Kabbalah speaks a little bit more about, the Zohar mentions it, and that's Galut Ishmael, the Galut of Islam. It will be a Galut within Galut Edom. In other words, we will be in Galut Edom and experience that particular type of exile, and especially those who have moved back to Israel will also experience, to a great extent, a different kind of Galut, Galut 
in their own land, but being attacked by Yishmael. So today we have a semi-galut within our land and all over the world too, called Galut Yishmael. And this is the Galut that will take place before Mashiach comes. What does this Galut accomplish? What it accomplishes, unfortunately, is a maximum distance between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because we're not in our land, we have no Bet HaMikdash. But that's Midah Kenege Midah, it's a measure for measure for what we have done. We have brought upon ourselves a maximum distance from Him, so He has brought upon us a maximum distance from Him in another way. And He has done it in such a way that it will not be easy for us to come back to Israel. So all these years, up until recently, Jews did not really come back in masses to Eretz Israel. It was hard. Hashem did not want that to happen, obviously. Otherwise, what was holding Jews back? Do you know how many tzaddikim tried to go to Israel, to move to Israel, and they couldn't? They, didn't, they were not given permission, Mishamayim, to do so. The Baal Shem Tov only got to Turkey. He was on his way. The Hafez Chaim recently wanted to move there in his last years. At the end, they just didn't let him. Somehow he got stopped. The Gaon of Vilna wanted to go. Many, many tried. They did not have permission. They didn't make it. Hashem did not want it for whatever reason. Now he's allowing it. That's what we're going to be talking about soon. Uh, what, what has exactly changed. But in the meantime, throughout all these day, uh, years of diaspora, 1941 years of diaspora that we're in now, Hashem made it so that we will be dispersed and it would not be easy for us to return. Nevertheless, what he did take care of Amisal in the Galut, is that we should remain Jewish. Or at least a great percentage of Jews will remain Jewish, despite we're exposed to all the goyim and to all our enemies and to all the Avodah Zarah. Despite all that, we remain Jewish. As opposed to many, many other nations and peoples that were thrown out, dispersed, exiled, and they all disappeared. So that in itself is a beautiful and incredible phenomena to, to, to look at that and to, and to pay attention to it. It's very important that, look at all this scattering. Yes, there is a intermarriage and some assimilation, unfortunately, but look what has happened. The Jewish nation is still around. They have not disappeared. He's looking after us. He's protecting us. Despite all the oppression, despite all the the difficulties that we've had to endure, we're still around. The next question, therefore, is, what will Hashem get out of this long diaspora, other than atonement? We say that a galut, an exile, is an atonement, an atonement for our sins. Okay, so many years have passed by. What will, what will come out of this? What is to be gained from being s scattered all over the world? Is there any other gain other than the Torah? Yes, there are some additional gains. The rabbis tell us, look how Hashem is able to accomplish so many things with one act. Even though it's an atonement for our sins, the fact that we're scattered all over the world, you know what it means? You know what benefit that is for the Jews? If they try to get us, if they try to go after us, they won't be able to catch all of us. <laughs> They're not going to be able to catch every single Jew. We're all over the place. Hitler, Mach Shemon, was able to get a big portion because they were in Europe. Imagine if you would have been able to come to Israel and to America. They did not allow it, of course. But Hashem intentionally did it so that they would not be able to get all of us in one place. Another advantage, another important point of being amongst the Goim all over the place is to be exposed to their Avodah Zarah, to their idols, to see all the falsehood in this kind of worship and to hopefully reflect upon how did we abandon Hashem? How do we abandon that source of life, the wellspring of life? How do we go and replace that and exchange that for borot nishbarim, for empty vessels, for all this nonsense? In other words, just look at it. Look where Hashem has brought us. He has brought us to a place where we can see with our own eyes that it's such, so empty, such full of lies and corruption. And we actually were immersed in that, and we actually followed and believed in that. So hopefully that was part of the intent too, that by being in these countries, where that's where they practice, we should come to the realization that this is not for us. 
this, and this is what we were doing? And this is what caused us to become distanced from Him? And now, by being in the Galut, we put our fate and destiny in the hands of human beings, instead of depending and being protected by Hashem directly. We have to rely on them. We are at their mercy, and they have no mercy for us. You know how many boats escaped Nazi Germany and were on their way to American shores, and they were told by this administration, not this one, but by America, to return? There were other countries too. And they were and those boats sank in the ocean or were eventually returned to where they where they left and they were sent back to the concentration camps. So we were at the mercy of the Goim who never had mercy over us. There were some some Goim, Motalam, the righteous of the Gentiles, who were very righteous. But they were the few. The majority was not sympathetic at all. So here we are at the Galud, realizing that we are at the mercy of the Goim, where before we had continuous hashgacha, divine providence of Hashem. So what, what does Hashem now want from us? In the Galut, ultimately what is expected of us and what is hoped is what happened in Egypt. At some point in Egypt, Batal Shabbatam al Hashem, the Jews had a little bit of respite because the king of Egypt, the power of Egypt, died, and they were able to cry out to Hashem, we've had enough of this. Get us out of here. That's, that's exactly what Hashem wants to hear. That the Jews should say, I've had enough. I want to go back home. Imagine the child realizing what he has done and coming to knock on his father's door. Let me in. I've had enough of this living in the street. I've had enough of being exposed to those elements. I want to come back home. And Hashem says, ah, with open arms I'll take you. Just say so. Just say so. Their cry went up to heaven. Hashem says, yes, the time has come to redeem you. I'll send Moshe Rabbeinu to get you out. That's what he's waiting for. Two things. Obviously, to get back to Hashem, which means to return to Him, to His ways, to His Torah. To express that we want to go back home to Eretz Israel, And also to say, we don't want to be here. Now, that's a much more difficult statement. Not to want to be here? What if you own a beautiful 5,000 square foot home in Beverly Hills? And you have three cars, and you have two maids, and you have a summer home in San Diego, and another home in, uh, in Palm Springs. And you just enjoy the standard of living here. You can live all of this and go to Israel? It's such a small little country that has all these wars and problems with terrorists. You see what I mean? So a lot of people are so comfortable here, they're not even thinking of what they should be thinking. We've had enough of this. We don't want it. This is not our home. People, don't, people forget that. People think that this is their home. We're in exile. We're in Galut. We belong in Eretz Israel. So that's what Hashem wants to hear from us, that we are no longer interested in this Galut. Some benefits, nevertheless, have come out of the Galut. As I said before, one benefit was that they cannot touch us. Another benefit is that all the goyim that need to convert because they have a divine spark in them, by seeing a Jew around them, they will be able to come close to us. There are a certain amount of goyim out there that want to convert if they were to know what Judaism is. There are just some, so many, Geret Tzedek we call them, real converts. By having a Jew placed in all these countries, you know, like having a Chabad everywhere, you know, a Jewish center, Jews everywhere, they will see the Jew, they will be attracted to it, and that would give them or enable them to come back or to, in this case, to convert. Another idea is the Jewish nation is supposed to be a light unto all the other nations. So by a Jew observing his Torah and mitzvot, you know what Kiddush Hashem we're able to do, to accomplish, to sanctify God's name, that the Goim should learn from us, if we were to be a light unto the nations, being an example to them, this would be a tremendous accomplishment. We did not always do such a good job. So there are various benefits, nevertheless, from being in the Galut. The question is, wait a minute, but with all the benefits, isn't the danger greater than all the benefits? Doesn't the danger of intermarriage and assimilation outweigh, perhaps, all these benefits? Okay, Hashem wants us to 
to of course to look up to him and to come back and to but right now in the meantime isn't there a greater danger what does it, doesn't Hashem know that there's always this greater danger of becoming assimilated doesn't that outweigh all the benefits people are concerned about the high rate of intermarriage over 50 percent in many countries what's going to happen to that there is a pasuk that says like this ki lo idach idach. even though we see it and we cry about it and we feel very very pained by it that a Jew marries a non-Jew you should know that no Jew is lost ki lo idach idach. everyone's neshama everyone's soul is still around Hashem keeps track where they are and that is why it's not surprising at all that many Spanish Jews whether they live in Mexico or in South America many Portuguese Jews whether they live in Portugal or in Brazil all of a sudden want to come back to Judaism, they want to embrace Judaism, they want to convert. Why? Because they remember a great-great-grandmother of theirs, not that they remember, in other words, they knew that all their their family from their mother's side or father's side, at least somebody, they lit candles before Friday, uh, before, before Shabbat, they covered it with a basket, they remember something else, they had a Jewish name, they remember something remotely Jewish, and they're being attracted to all of this. What, what is this? This is another type of convert. There's different reasons why people convert. One is because they have a holy spark and that they're really, really divine, and that which is divine is attracted to that which is divine, to that which is holy. But there are some who may have been Jewish in the past. And I said before, Hashem says, I will not allow anyone to be abandoned, to be lost completely. What was lost is a, is a physical body, but the soul is still around. If that man dies, his soul is still Jewish. He's not gone. He's going to come back reincarnated and hopefully be born Jewish again and have Jewish children the next time around. Nobody's lost. If that's the case, then what are we so concerned about? Every Hashem will take care of everybody. The reason why we're concerned about intermarriage and assimilation is because in the meantime, in every generation, where there's a tremendous amount of assimilation into marriage, it means the bad side, the bad guys are winning. It means the forces of impurity are overpowering. And what is that doing? It is delaying the Galut. It is delaying the diaspora. It is delaying the, the, the Jewish presence in the exile. It is delaying the, the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. It is delaying so many good things. So we cannot allow, we cannot tolerate something like this. We have to stop it in any way possible. It is wrong. It is a, ter- it's a terrible crime to the Jewish nation to allow for something like this. So therefore, when Hashem appears to Moshe for the first time, He appears to him in a burning bush. Remember the story with the burning bush? What's a burning bush? Hashem is telling Moshe two ideas in the, within the burning bush. Idea number one, you see the bush burning? Why is there a bush burning? Anochi tam batzara. Hashem says, I am with you in the tzara. Whenever you are in the tzara, when you are in the exile, the Shekhinah is also in exile. We are in trouble, so is the Shekhinah. Kavyachol, I mean, it, in, in a sense, it also is in, not in the best situation. We'd love the entire world to believe in Hashem, Shashem Echad Ushmo Echad, that Hashem is one, for all to, to worship Him. So, as long as the Jewish nation is in exile, there's no Bet HaMikdash, we're not in Eretz Israel, the Shekhinah is also Betzar in pain. That's the burning bush. I'm with them in their pain, they're not in that pain alone. But the burning bush is also lo ukal. It was not consumed by the fire. That was the second message. Even though they are in pain, even though they are in trouble, I will not allow them to be completely, chaz v'shalom, God forbid, to be consumed by the fire. You see the two messages? I am with them. They are in pain, so am I. And that's terrible. And, but, even though they are in pain, I will not allow for them to be completely consumed, to be consumed by that pain. They will never be destroyed completely. I'll take care of them, even in the diaspora, even though when, when they are still in the exile. So what do we have to do today? For the time being, while we're still in the exile, we have to work on the most dangerous exile of all, and that is the spiritual exile that I mentioned before, that we had during the time of the Greeks. We have that too today. Today the spiritual exile is much more dangerous and more difficult than the physical exile. 
What's the physical exit today? Big deal. We're in exile, we're in America, it's very comfortable here. The weather here is great in Southern California. I mean, I can understand people on the East Coast, they have a terrible exile. They have a terrible winter, it's cold, they have to shovel snow. They have a terrible summer, it's humid and hot, they're always running away. You know, I always ask New Yorkers, why do you live in New York? In the, win in the winter you run to Miami, in the summer you run to the mountains. You're always running away. You might as well not live here. What do you live here for? What an exile. This is at least a nice exile. It is, comparatively. I mean, if you go all over the world, this is comfortable. 75 degrees the whole year round. Eternal spring, more or less, right? You know, it's really nice. The grass is green. The streets are clean. The people say hi or hello or good morning to you, right? You have the beaches. You have the mountains. <laughs> Anything you want. Within a half an hour's time, you can get snow, you can get the desert, you can get the ocean. Right? The standard of living is pretty good here. That's a spiritual galut. Spiritual galut means that a Jew does not realize that this is not his home. He doesn't realize that he, should not, he does not belong here. He belongs in Eretz Israel. He's very comfortable here. And many of the Reformed Jews, especially their leaders, when I talk about reform, I'm talking about the leaders because many of the people who belong to that group do not even realize what it is and how far they've, they've, they've uh, moved away from Judaism. But their leaders, the founders of that movement, they basically said Berlin is Jerusalem. America is their new homeland, a new country. There's, there's no reason to go back. That is a spiritual galut, which is a much more dangerous kind of galut, where the Jew forgets himself, forgets what his purpose in life is, forgets that he doesn't belong here. Okay, we have a few more minutes, and what I want to do right now is talk about the importance of living in Israel, and the big question of all, one of the biggest questions of our times is, are we allowed to move to Israel? And you might say, what, what kind of a question is that? Well, I'm going to tell you soon why this is a question to some Jews, not to the majority, but to some. First of all, Yeshuv Eretz Yisrael, living in Eretz Yisrael has always been a very, very important mitzvah. And even, say, even though I'm saying it's a mitzvah, some say it's not exactly a mitzvah, an obligation by the Torah. Some say that it's a mitzvah de oraita by the Torah, some say it's a mitzvah de Rabbanan. There's not there is no real agreement as to when this mitzvah, if it is a mitzvah, when does it apply, under what circumstances. But everybody was always in agreement that if possible, actual living in Eretz Israel is a beautiful thing to do, if possible. Nobody disagreed with that. The living there, the, be able, the, the ability to perform certain mitzvot that only apply there, the holiness of the land, the benefits of being there, nobody disagrees with that. The Gemara is full of... of, of expressions, positive feelings about living there. In other words, the outlook, the attitude of, of our rabbis has always been positive towards moving there and living there. There's no question about it. The main idea that was therefore always expressed is regardless of whether, the, whether there's a mitzvah or not, one should always aspire to be there. One should always want to move there. Because that is where we should all be. No disagreement about that, if possible. One should always want to be there. So what is the problem? There are some who claim that even though we've gone to Israel in the past and Jews have always lived there, some have a problem with moving there en masse. You know what en masse means? A lot of people at once. Because there's some mention in the Gemara about shalosh shvuot, three oaths that Hashem made with us and with the Goyim. Oath number one, we should not move en masse to Israel because we're in the diaspora, we're in exile, remember? Second oath, we should not rebel against the nations while we are in their countries, in their exile. We should not rebel against them, but be nice citizens. And the third oath was that the Goyim should not subject us to too much hard labor Right? Should not give us too much of a hard time. Those are the three oaths. Okay, now since we have an oath here, an oath appears to be that 
it will prevent us from actually carrying out any idea or plan of moving there en masse, right? Because there's an oath. So what do we do about this? Before I tell you why all these oaths do not exactly apply today, I want to say three important comments. There is a group out there, and I'm not going to mention the name, it's not important, who's very much opposed to the State of Israel, very anti-Zionist, very anti-moving en masse to Israel, very anti-Israel, just very anti the whole establishment there. And you may have heard about them. They've made a lot of noise in the paper. Many of them have long beards and appear to be observant Jews. Maybe, maybe even some of them are rabbis. And that is what prompted me to speak a little bit about this. How could this be that here you have Jews who are against Israel? Now, if you ask them, so I'm not against Israel, the land of Israel. I'm against the government. I'm against moving there en masse and so forth. So we have to, we have to really confront this problem and be 100% sure that we are right and they are wrong. So what I want to do is say the following. Three comments. Comment number one, we always should remember that whenever there's any disagreement in halakha, in opinion, in outlook, the Torah says very clearly, we follow the majority ruling. The majority of rabbis have gotten together in assembly after assembly. Rabbis who are God-fearing, Torah observant, of course, not just any rabbi who calls himself a rabbi, gotten themselves in the various gatherings in Europe, before the war even, where they declared that this is the right thing to do, to support the reestablishment of Jewish presence in Eretz Israel, one way or another. Yes, we will support that idea. And how do you may ask, how did this come about that they all of a sudden thought about it? Well, for those who read history who remember how Israel today was formed, we're talking about the Balfour Agreement, right? We're talking about the various other resolutions, especially the United Nations resolutions that came through with allowing the Jewish people to move there. That's how all these discussions came about. So we have the majority ruling that we need to follow, we always did follow, the majority ruling is the rules and determines, and they have determined that this is the right thing to do. Comment number two, regardless of people's opinion, people are entitled to an opinion. It's a chilul Hashem, it is a desecration of God's name to demonstrate in public with your agreements and your problems, because by doing so, you're giving ammunition to the enemy. We have enough enemies. By going in the public and speaking in, in, on television and on the radio and having a picture taken by the newspaper who are anti-Semite and voicing your opinion against all these rabbis who have made a determination that this is the right thing to do, to oppose that in public is a chilul Hashem, it's a desecration of Hashem's name. That's not the place to voice your opinion in public. People have a right, of course, to protest, people have a right to, to say what they have a right to, to whatever, whatever they want to say, but there's a way to do it. This is a Chilul Hashem, what you've been doing, the secretion of Hashem's name. And that is why they're ostracized and condemned in every way possible by all the rest of Jewry. Third comment. What is going on today in Eretz Israel is already a fact. Let's say you had an argument about moving there or establishing the state 60, 70 years ago. I can understand you arguing about it back then, but today it's already de facto. We have so many Jews living there. You want to, you want to expose them to danger? You want no more Jews to move there? You, don't, you want them to leave defenseless? You want them to be by themselves without any protection? Come on, where is your heart? But obviously there are some Jews without a heart, and they belong to the Erev Rav, to those multitudes of people that joined the Jewish nation when we left Egypt, they don't have a Jewish soul. And that is why they're anti anything that is Jewish. There are people like that. They can be religious too. But their heart is not with Judaism, not 100% at least. And there are various ways that you can detect them. And one way is if they're more friendly to the enemy than to their own brethren. Anytime a Jew embraces the enemy in a way that is... That is uh, Anathema, I guess they call it in English, in a way that is, yeah? Anathema, in a way which is disgusting, where everybody is repulsed by it. 
right? That tells you something about him. So these are the three important comments that I wanted to make. Now, as far as disproving them, why are they wrong and why should we support the reestablishment of Eretz Israel and eventually move there? As far as the three vows that we spoke about, as far as the vow about not moving there en masse, we, we know clearly that if we get permission from the goyim, there's no such vow, there's no such oath, there's no breaking of any oath. We receive permission from them. And the Malbim and other commentaries actually tell us that Mashiach will come about in such a way, the process of the Mashiach, the redemption, the process of coming back to Israel will come about by receiving permission from the nations of the world. That's exactly what happened in the United Nations. Even Russia, one of the only times in the history of the United Nations that Russia agreed with the United States on something. Even though they had their, their own interest to do so, nevertheless, they both voted yes on a Jewish state. So we received permission. When else in history did we receive permission to come back to Israel? It happened already in the past. Koresh, the king of Persia, allowed the Jews to go back and to rebuild their temple. Permission again. And the Gemara is very outspoken about those Jews that did not come and join their brothers in Israel. Had everybody come from Babylonia, from Persia, back to Israel? The Gemara says, it's understood from the Gemara, that the Shekhinah's presence in the second temple would have been greater. The prophecy would never have gone away or disappeared. We would have continued to have prophets. And number three, we would never have had to defend ourselves from the enemy, put up walls and defenses. The enemy would not have bothered us had everybody moved back. So we see the importance of that, of that idea of moving back, especially when we got permission. And we got permission now. With all the declarations, the Balfour declarations, the United Nations resolutions, and all the other resolutions, it was a clear, clear, no, no doubt about permission from the Goyim to go back. So that's whoever wants to contest that with, us, with the oath. It doesn't apply when there's permission. Another interesting point is that we have a tradition that right before Mashiach comes, if Am Yisrael is not doing enough Teshuvah, Hashem will elect, bring about a king whose decrees will be as terrible as the, dec as the decrees of Haman Rasha. And what was the decree of Haman Rasha to wipe out the Jewish nation? Who thought of that recently? Hitler. too. Yeah, but he hasn't done anything yet. We hope he won't succeed. Chaz shalom, I mean. But, of course, many would like to do that. But who actually planned it, intended it, wanted it, and did something about it was Hitler. And we know they're all from Amalek. So was Haman. Amalek is the only one who has that ability to actually cause us tremendous harm. And That's a whole different topic. But our tradition says very clearly that this could happen. Had it, I think, or some would like to say, it already did. He already attempted, and he got away with one-third, wiping out one-third. We were 18 million Jews in 1938. Do you know that? 18 million more than today. Six million were gone, we were left with 12, and now we're back to about 14, 15. That's it. There's less, family, less smaller families in some communities. Some communities have larger families. So what is happening over here is, very, is a very interesting point. This Melech, who his decrees are as terrible as the decrees of Haman, will come to be in power right before Mashiach comes. And what will happen as a result of that, Hashem says? And because of that, Am Yisrael will start doing Teshuvah. Another way of looking at it is not only will Amisha start doing Teshuvah, Amisha will start coming back to their land. Because as a result of the Holocaust, more than anything else, that is what brought about the reestablishment of the State of Israel. Whether, whether you agree or not, it's a fact. It's not a coincidence, isn't it? That right after the most terrible tragedy in Jewish history, the greatest Holocaust of all, I think, that we should come back after close to 2,000 years, that one should be so close to each other, you think that's a coincidence? right after the greatest tragedy, Khurban, destruction of Europe, of European Jewry, that we should all come back to Israel from all over the world, just like that, that they should think up in the United Nations, yes, the Jews deserve a homeland. Yes, it's about time. Let's give them that sliver of land that is as big as the state of New Jersey. Right? Why not? Eh, okay, what's the big deal, right? 
It doesn't happen, nothing happens for, for, by, by chance. Nothing happens without supervision from above. We all believe that everything happens from above. So this happened because Jews wanted it? No, this happened because Hashem, that was a part of Hashem's plan, that before Mashiach, a terrible king will emerge whose decrees will bring this about. So indirectly, here he's trying to destroy, and here he's also reestablishing Jewish presence in Eretz Yisrael once again. The fact that we have constant aliyah every day, planes landing in Israel, that also says something. That is also always a, always have, has been a clear indicator that we're in the process of redemption. Chafetz Chaim once expressed when he was uh, told about what they were discussing, the Gentiles, the Balfour Declaration, he says, if that's what the Goim are discussing, if that's what's on their mind, I see in that an hitaruta de leela, I see an awakening up, an awakening in the in heaven of, of uh, mercy for Am Yisrael, an awakening that is bringing about, slowly, in stages, the Geula. I see in this an awakening. The only thing the Chafetz Chaim added after that was, but I am concerned that the Jews will ruin it for themselves. Here they have a great opportunity, but they will delay it. They will not do things right. There will be mistakes made. So he, will, he had certain concerns, but he felt that this was obviously Rachmei Shamaim. Mercy from heaven. Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld some, said something incredible, and I very, very much think that his words should be made public all over the, the world. When he was hearing about this, and he was a pretty strong-minded person. I mean, he didn't uh, associate too much with the Zionists. I mean, he was very, very strong. But he looked at this very positively. He said, listen, imagine that we didn't have rain for 2,000 years. 2,000 years of no rain, and all of a sudden, a small cloud appeared in the distance. It would make us shiver and tremble with excitement, wouldn't it? He says, despite anything else you want to say, despite all the problems and complaints you may have about the Zionists, despite all of that, wouldn't that send shivers up your spine? Wouldn't that make you tremble with excitement that something is definitely about to happen? He says, that's what this is. He says, after so many years that we see a small cloud of hope, a ray of hope, in that, in that declaration, we should definitely be excited. There's a sefer called Meir Einei Chachamim, written by the Oslo Tzerebe. And he says like this, <laughs> He also supports this whole idea very, very clearly. A lot, basically, most of the rabbis supported this, but he, he was very, very clear on why this happens the way it happens. He says, you know, the med, there is a medrash that says, why is the pig called a chazir? Why is the chazir called a chazir? What kind of a word is that? So he says, chazir means to return. The chazir, one day, will return that which he took. The Roman Empire, Esav, is called the Chazir. What they took from us, what they robbed from us, they're eventually going to give it back to us. The way Hashem makes it happen is that the Christians take the land of Israel away from the Muslims. First, the English Empire took it from the Turks, from the Muslims, not from the Arabs. They take it from the Muslims, and we will take it from the Christians. We will get it from the Christians. They will give it back to us. What they took, they will return to us. Why can't we take it from the Arabs directly? No, that you can't do. There's too much competition. He is circumcised and so are you. As the Zohar says, he will give you trouble till the very, very end because he's circumcised and so are you. And if you're not more religious than he is, you're going to have a problem. Because so he's, he also has a claim to the land. But the Zohar says that their claim to the land will disappear soon. When they lose control over the land, which they did with the Turkish Empire out of the way, they will lose complete control and the Jew will start coming back, trickling back. We will still have trouble with them because he's not completely gone. He's still around. But he will not have the same Ahizan as he had before. But in order for this to happen smoothly without accusations from above, without too many troubles, it has to go first to Christian hands. So the land of Israel is taken from Muslims by the Christians, the English, and the English give it back to us. Incredible insight. Rav Chaim Vital says that the whole oath of not going on Mass was for a thousand years. 
The Vilna Gon says that the whole oath was only intended so that we know we do not go and rebuild the temple. Hashem wants us to be a certain amount of time in the exile so that we don't go in mass and do it ourselves before the time arrives. So here we have additional opinions that the oath does not apply today. It lasts for a thousand years. It only applies to the Betamidash. And then we have an additional opinion that says, hey, wait a minute. There was a third oath that says that they're not supposed to subject you to too much pain and suffering. But they overdid it. Because they overdid it, that means they did not keep their part of the oath. We don't have to keep our part of the oath either. That's just another opinion. The last question is, what some people may have a hard time with, okay, fine, Hashem is managing this whole thing. It's clear. Nothing happens without His permission. But why should it be built by secular hands, by these Zionists who are not religious? Why should they have the zechut, the merit? After all, they don't really want a Jewish state. They just want to get away from the ghetto. Why should it happen through their hands? Well, first of all, good things can happen through people who are not so righteous. We, f we see that from Yerovam in the Tanakh, who was a wicked king, worshipped idols, the terrible things. During his reign, he was able to recover a lot of land to, for Israel. How was he so successful? Hashem allowed for him to be successful regardless of who he was. So we see that good things can happen even through individuals who are not so righteous. The fact that something good happens does not, does not does mean that it, it cannot if it would be through a non-Jewish person or non-righteous person. Hashem has many ways of getting things done. And He has His reasons why this individual should do it. And He doesn't have to be righteous. It could still be done. That's number one. Number two, I always felt, and I saw some rabbis that agreed with me, I always felt that the ones who contributed to the destruction of the Second Temple were the Biryonim, rebels, people who were not interested in making peace with the Romans, people who, troublemakers, not very observant Jews, just elements in society who were really not too good. And it caused us a lot of trouble. Hashem says, you know what, you guys, you brought the destruction of the Second Temple, you caused it. You contributed to the destruction of Israel. When the time comes to rebuild Israel, you are going to be at the forefront. You're going to make all the roads. You're going to build the infrastructure. You're going to dry the malaria swamps. You're going to clean up the land. You're going to plant the trees. I'm going to make Keren Kayemet out of you. I'm going to make Solel Bone out of you. I'm going to make many companies out of you to build the entire land. Because soon I'm going to bring all my kids home, Hashem says. They have to have a place to come home to. You destroyed it, you rebuild it. And I think that that is a lot to that. And obviously Hashem's other plan, which is also very simple to see, Hashem wants unity amongst every one of us. All segments of, Jew of Jewry, those who are not so religious, with those who are religious, those who are Hasidic, and those who are Yemenite. Hashem wants the entire diaspora to come together to become one nation. There's no more time for us to be split and not united. So therefore, every one of us, the secular and the non-secular, the kibbutznik and the religious, the Hasidim, everybody in some way will have a part of building Eretz Israel. So what's left for us to do here in Los Angeles <laughs> and anywhere else in the diaspora? It is incumbent upon us right now to demonstrate, to prove to Hashem what is more important in our life, what is holier. Is Los Angeles more important and holier than Israel? Or is Israel and Yerushalayim more important? That's what we have to demonstrate. We have to call out to Hashem. We have to pray to Hashem. That is what we want. That is what we aspire to. That is more important to us than the Galut, than the exile. That's number one. Number two, as far as moving there, whoever can move there and he will have a source of income there, the rabbis tell us today, the rabbis of today, even in the past, they told us, whoever would have it easy there should move. There has to be a real, real good reason for somebody to stay. If it is possible to move, you never have to stay. In the, there's no mitzvah to stay anymore in the exile. It was difficult in the past. It was really difficult to move to Israel. Israel had no infrastructure. Today, Israel is a place where almost any Jew can move to, as long as he will be able to provide for himself and his family. It will be the safest place on earth very soon. You're going to see. Safer than any other spot on the, on the globe. Mashiach is coming. So that is the place where we want to think of moving. And in some ways, the Kabbalah is very clear that that will be the final birur. One will be able to see 
if a Jew is truly attached to Israel, whether he makes an effort, or at least if he aspires to move there, every Jew should want to at least move there. And if he can't, he doesn't have to move yet. But anybody who can, parents who are, kids are already married, who are retired, who don't have to work hard, they have some source of income, for sure should move there. There's no reason to stay behind. As long as it is possible, the time has come to move there. The greatest news of all, and with this I'd like to finish, the greatest news of all that I've heard recently is that Baruch Hashem for the first time in the entire history of this long exile, there are more Jews in Eretz Israel than in any other country in the world for the first time. Only 10,000 Jews or so at the turn of the 20th century. Only 600,000 Jews in 1948. And today there's a little over 6 million Jews in Eretz Israel, more than any other country in the diaspora. Today, there are more Jews in Eretz Israel. You know what that means? It means that Baruch Hashem, we're at the threshold, on the threshold of Mashiach, and Bezat Hashem, all of us soon are going home. Thank you.